Welcome to Authors Out Loud, a series of discussions with authors exploring their books, delving into their inspirations for characters and themes and stories, as well as discussing the craft of writing itself, the trials and victories they experience in bringing their work to completion. My name is Rosemary Cooper. I am the director of the Albert Wisner Public Library in Warwick, New York. And my co-host is Susan Supak, the host of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute's podcast at the University of North Texas in Denton. We are speaking with Afia Atakora, whose debut novel has made an impact across the literary world with high accolades, stellar reviews, and interesting, very, very timely conversations. Athea's novel, Conjure Women, is an engrossing story that sweeps across the time periods just before, during, and after the Civil War. Welcome, Athea. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so pleased to be here. <laughs> we are delighted to have you here. You weave a very interesting tale about a mother and daughter who are the healers of their community and also conjurers of hoodoo, magic to help or to curse. But the story goes much deeper than that, exploring the lives of slaves on a plantation in the southern part of the United States during a very turbulent and defining time in American history. What prompted you to write this novel? Did you have a specific message to tell? Actually, I think maybe I wrote the book for myself. Um, I, when I sort of began the research, it wasn't to write a novel. It was out of my own curiosity. Um, so just a little backstory. I went to uh, NYU for my undergrad. I studied screenwriting, but I always kind of say I, I accidentally got a major in history as well um, because I just, I tried to take as many history courses as I could just to, for one, I think history is stories, right? So I got to sit in class and hear these stories, but also um, just as a black woman, as a, as a young person, I wanted to sort of um, be able to locate myself in history and also understand um, sort of the, the cursory overview that I felt that I had had in this time period, in the civil war and slavery. I think we have these kind of overarching images um, that we're all used to seeing. And I really wanted to delve into that and see, okay, who are these people um, in this time period? What were their lives really like outside of the sort of bullet point? Um, so it began just, just out of my own curiosity and just wanting to immerse myself in the time period. And then when it came time to sort of write, I had this, um, I had this reconstruction era. It is sort of the main um, 10 year period that the book is structured around. I knew I wanted to sort of delve into that time period. Um, so again, it, it just became sort of a, an exploratory experience for me. Mm -hmm. So Afia, you talk about how you immersed yourself into the time period, because clearly you didn't live through the Civil War. Um, but so you read all that you could on the topic. Um, and did you find that was particularly informative in the process, I mean, that you needed to really do quite a bit of research um, on it before you could even fashion a story of characters and, uh, and themes as you did in the book. Yeah, as I said, I think I had sort of an overview, um, but to really be able to write the characters, I wanted to have that sort of first person perspective, that close, um, sort of inside perspective of, of what it was like to live during a time. And I think during a, an important historic period, and I think we're seeing now as well um, in our own times that you sometimes are part of history, but you, you still have your ordinary life, right? You yeah. still have these, these daily um, grinds that are, that are your main focus that are mm -hmm. outside of sort of the literary or historic time period that you find yourself living in um, from an outsider's perspective. And so I really wanted to focus on these, these characters and these people um, who don't realize they're living in extraordinary times or if they do are concerned more with their ordinary lives than, than they ever can be about the sort of bullet point in history that they're, they're stuck in. Yeah, so your, your whole um, immersion really put you into a world where you then could imagine these individual characters who might not have the same perspective that you as the writer had Absolutely. brought in 
you brought in a way of tying it all together. I think I think that's that is so, such a big part of what makes the book so so very enjoyable. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I was not aware of the WPA slave narrative collection until I learned that they were some of the resources that you used for your book. Those are interviews for our viewers. They're interviews conducted with ex-slaves from 1936 to 1938. And it is so good to have these oral histories, to capture these invaluable first person accounts. I'm just blown away that they had the foresight to do those at that time. And it's so good that these oral histories were done to capture this. And I understand it's the largest body of slave memories to be found anywhere. I would strongly encourage our viewers to explore the narratives. They're available online at the Library of Congress, very easy to access, and there are pictures also. Did you read stories from particular states, and how did you use these memories in crafting your novel? And another question, were there other resources that you used? Yeah, so the WPA is great resource. Again, it's in, the, it's in the public record so anyone can access it very easily and that was absolutely a jumping point for me. Um, yeah, they so it was uh, collected during the um, Great Depression as sort of an, an arts project, um, a job creation project for a lot of anthropologists and, and young artists and so they hold these interviews with sort of um, these ex-slaves who are at this point in their 70s and 80s and in the 1930s. Um, so it's such a rich resource and it's also a resource of, of memory, right? So it's not, it's an anthropological project, but it, it also is about um, memory and about the way you sort of view your childhood or your experiences, right? And so I felt like that, um, that level of, of remove and sort of a composite experience um, was what I wanted to create it, wanted to create in the book. Um, and so in terms of was there one particular state or area, I really wanted to um, sort of mimic the WPA interviews in that respect and have them be a, a composite of memory and a composite of all these different states. Um, so I, I very much tried to draw from, say, Florida and Georgia in, in creating my sort of imaginary style. Um, and then once I sort of had that as, as a point of entry, I, again, tried to look into sort of diaries, um, news articles, again, any first person close narratives um, of people's experiences and just their day to day um, memories. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Afia, I'm sure we have a lot of people who, who love to write too and are sort of envious of you and, and your very <laughs> first novel just hitting it right out of the ballpark. Um, you know, could you talk a little bit to them about your process for writing, uh, how you actually go about writing maybe this particular book? You're probably working on something else right now. How long it took you to write it and how you went about doing that? Yeah, so I, I always knew I wanted to be a writer. Um, I've always loved stories. Um, and so I, I, I worked in the library before, <laughs> before this and that was sort of my, my career. And then I turned to, um, I went to get my MFA at Columbia University, which was just sort of a, for me, it was a path forward. It was a way to immerse myself in um, writing in the writing community and make connections. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, from a practical standpoint, I definitely wanted to have sort of a coursework um, to focus myself. So that was a decision that I made. Um, and then as for that, I, I there was a requirement of a thesis of, I think it was 150 words or 150 pages, sorry, mm -hmm. um, to sort of complete the coursework. And, and that's from where this book was born. I, <laughs> I was at the very end of sort of my time period in doing that and I was like, okay, I need to come up with something. And I sort of came up with this midwife character in this reconstruction era past. And from there it sort of flowed. I, I, I didn't know what I wanted to say. I didn't know what the stories were going to be, but I knew I had sort of these anecdotal um, experiences that I wanted this midwife to have. And so for me, it was just, what what interested me the most about these characters? What parts of their history did I want to explore? And once I had that, um, which took me about nine months, I would say, 
it's perfect for for yeah. a book about babies. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and you gave but birth to your own. <laughs> I gave birth to my own while, and then and then there was a sort of like raising up period, right? I had to sort right. of, um, and that took about two years. I had an agent and an editor, and we sort of worked together to look at these sort of disparate um, short stories that I had kind of I framed it as a novel, but it was also sort of a, a connected short story. Mm -hmm. um, experience at that time and so the work then was really sort of putting them putting the stories in different conversation with each other putting them in different order and and seeing what kind of fell out what what rose to the surface mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so out of your experience in writing this novel were there any insights or surprises that have stayed with you i think that one in particular the the <laughs> the idea that there are so many ways you can tell a story um, that just the order of events tells a different a different story. Um, it was a lot of work. <laughs> um, it took a lot of time, but but I think it came out beautifully. And then I think sort of the um, the way you sort of get involved. I think I put a lot of myself in the novel that I wasn't expecting to see in the characters, mm -hmm. um, and and that was that was part of the journey as well. Was sort of figuring out what story I wanted to tell that I didn't realize I kind of had bubbling inside of me. Uh, so let's talk about those characters a little bit, Sophia. Um, especially the women. The women's relationships in this book are so complex, I think, so deep and yet so true and central to their to the story and to their characters. They have such a richness of to them that we're drawn to each of them and their stories. And they're often in conflict with each other in, in the story. Um, there's some fairly serious conflicts. Uh, we have Rue and Verena and Maybell and Sarah, and yet they're so fiercely loyal to each other. They, they, are, they defend each other almost to uh, to degree that many of us, you know, are never called to or or actually avail ourselves of in our own relationships. And I wondered what you were trying. Uh, you just mentioned it reflects a bit about about your own self. Uh, what were you trying to share with the reader as far as women's relationships um, in developing these characters and their stories? Yeah. So I think even though there's sort of this historical. Um, element in this very specific time period I wanted to to replicate sort of the timelessness of of growing up of, of coming of age of uh, female friendships of defining yourself as as the woman that you want to become and that's very much based in your relationships whether it's a mother or that sort of formative friendship or um, even the structures of society that you're railing against I think all of that um, I wanted to explore and then uh, I think there was also a sense that historically speaking a lot of these these women um, were drawn in relation to the men in their lives right so if the man was a, a soldier or a slave or a president or what have you all of these sort of female characters or female figures that we see in history are always kind of in relation um, to their male to male uh, figures and so I wanted to see what sort of female interactions they had and what sort of female richness might be behind those histories that we hadn't really explored figuring we don't we don't because maybe they're not as active um right. they're not again those bullet points that we see I wanted to really explore sort of the more quiet um aspects of, of growing up Mm -hmm. I think they made, I mean, it was what made this story so authentic is, is that those relationships, <clears throat> as, as in conflict or contentious they may have been over certain issues, they were, they were there together in each other's lives, the way people really are in each other's lives, um, and, and not always, you know, in a total agreement and blissful, uh, uh, you know, just blissful harmony and love right. with each other, so. I really, really think that that's an outstanding part of the book that I'm sure others will enjoy as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your characters are so strong and they just 
absorb the reader into the details of the thoughts and the interactions they have with others and using very creative details, I must say, like the birth of being struggling to be free of that amniotic sac. I still have that image in my <laughs> mind that, you know, was enclosing him when he was being birthed and then appearing into the world with those strange and eerie eyes. What prompted you to develop the characters that you did the way you did? I mean, with these details, they're incredible. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I mean, specifically uh, with Bean, I think it, I drew from sort of horror fiction, definitely. So the, the idea of the accursed child and the black eyes. Um, and then with Rue as a midwife, the idea of um, sort of the magical woman or the witch in the woods and, and what would her childhood look like. Um, the same with Miss Maybell. Um, there's a preacher. Uh, so sort of all these figures, um, sort of these, uh, these archetypes that we see in, in books and especially in this sort of genre of, of historical fiction, slave fiction. I really wanted to, uh, even Verena, the, the Southern Belle, to sort of put them in these positions and these sort of chess pieces <laughs> against mm -hmm. each other and then and then sort of unpack what their history might be beyond the archetype. Um, so again, what is that history of, of the magical uh, healing woman? What is the history of the preacher man uh, that gets into that point? What, what does the first child feel? Um, so all of those things were sort of... Um, reverse engineered almost, uh, <laughs> unpacked. Mm -hmm. um, and that for me was just a fascinating process and the part I think I enjoyed the most was sort of creating these characters and taking them to these sort of logical extensions of, of who they are. Oh, you know, that makes so much sense as, as we're reading. And I have to admit to you, Afia, that your book is probably one of the few books that I read three times. <laughs> I read it three times, and each time was even more absorbed and felt that I, I, I just got into the story. So that, I think, is a, a testament to, you know, the depth of the creation of the art. Yeah. Really well, you're my dream reader now. <laughs> <laughs> I but can't I do. do that with many books, but three times, uh, indeed. So, um, and this is now, we're coming to probably the, our favorite part of our interviews, which is where you will read and share with us a part of this wonderful book that Absolutely. you've written. Absolutely. Okay, tell us a bit also why, you know, you'll read us a portion and maybe share with us a little bit about why you chose to share that one. Yeah, so I have, I have my arc. It's a little different, actually, which is, <laughs> oh, okay. um, it's an earlier version, uh, so it that. might be a little, <laughs> little different, but um yeah, I wanted to share this section. So the section is actually from quite late in the book. It's about uh, 376. Again, my edition might be a bit different. Um, uh -huh. But it's sort of late in the book, but no spoilers. Um, okay. But it's also, I think for me, um, playing with voice was another part of, of the book that I really enjoyed was sort of creating these characters, as I said, and then playing with their voices. So we get a little bit of a... Um, an insight into each of them uh, as the sort of, as the narrative weaves. Um, and so this one is sort of an outlier, um, but I think it's, so the, the title of the section is In the Beginning. Um, and it sort of, uh, it goes back to, it's about the middle passage um, of, of a slave coming to the United States um, and sort of those hazy memories. And I think it sort of embodies these different characters, and again, that again, that composite of memory and that sort of um, of trying to define yourself and your relationships in in history and and within your ordinary life. And so, this is in the beginning. Um, and we'll share that. In the beginning, there was the ship hold, the early swirling motion of the sea, sickening, the heat of fever, the heat of fear. The only thing cold, the new chains, and even those warmed quick and rusted over with rubbing, with sores, with blood, with futile struggle. The darkness, the void of the black ship bottom, the darkness on the face of the deep. And then someone said unto them, let there be light, piercing light. Did you know light could hurt so bad? On the deck above, they were made to dance under that brightness. So much light, the light of the heavens, 
and also the light of the heavens reflected on the sea. And the few black bodies that got somehow free of the dance went jumping into that sea, blind, perhaps confusing the sea they'd never seen before for heaven, God's face in the waters, waste that, false prophets. The rest of them were sent back to the dark void till the ship reached firmament. She had no words for them. They hadn't given them to her yet. But if she fought back and tried to give words to the memories of the ship and after, there was the one that had rung out when they'd stood her up before the curious white faces and made her hold out her arms and then hold open her mouth and then hold open her legs. Sold. And what was a mama, the warm body that you made in a time and a place in a land you couldn't remember? Or was a mama what you made for yourself, the good warm body, the first kind memory of the older woman who slept beside you in the hayloft, who let you fold into her warmth that first evening that you were owned? And she hummed to you because she couldn't speak what you spoke. And that first sense of love, the earth still for the first time beneath your back, and for the first time for an opening in the roof, the evening sky, you can make do unspoken kindness and the stars also. So that's a little preview from the book. Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow, that is so powerful. Indeed, so powerful. yeah. You know, Afia, I just wanted to ask you, you read that so beautifully um, as a story. Is, is your book available on in audio tape? Or it is, it is. Okay. It I was is. looking for it and I just, I wanted to be sure I knew that. So that's good to hear. Who, who reads it? Uh, it's written, it's read by uh, Adam really Ojo is okay. the narrator. She's a prolific uh, wow. narrator okay. and she's brilliant. She does a much better job. Oh, <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, thank you. Yeah, lovely I don't know um, if that's possible. That was <laughs> now, I love the way you use the title Miss with Miss Maybell showing such respect for her healing powers and her magical powers. And then as a title, it was passed on to her daughter when Rue, when she took over for her mother in her mother's role. Can you talk about your decision to use this title as a way of imparting their importance? It was very clever. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, that in particular for me was sort of a study of, of the South, right? And our sort of expectations of this mannerly. Um, world in this world with so much uh, structure and place, um, societal sort of uh, expectations. And so I was really taken with, with the power of Miss, um, even Miss Verena, who as a child, Rue has to, has to refer to her as, as Miss Verena, even though um, they're the same age, mm -hmm. um, to just sort of imbue those levels of, of power. And so, um, you know, in, in crafting this Maybell and sort of her strange place in her society, I really wanted her to have that sort of miss and to take pride in the miss, even though it's this sort of uh, complicated um, title and role and expectation. Mm -hmm. um, and then for Rue to sort of adopt it in her mother's place to only become miss because her mother died. Um, all of that, I think the 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 societal sort of pressures um, and the, the sort of historical uh, place that w that women find themselves in was what I wanted to really explore with that in particular. Mm -hmm. Well, Rue and, and her mother, Miss Miss Maybell, um, were both healers. Um, but in throughout the book, we also um, introduced to the concept of hoodoo yeah. magic which is a part, a big part of, you know, their healing is intertwined with that, especially Miss Maybell. Um, and it's really interesting, the mysteriousness of it, and in parts it's more alluded to, um, it's definitely a strong uh, under, overcurrent in the, in the storytelling, and all of the somewhat mysterious things that occur throughout the book, trying to piece together um, you know, what actually is happening, uh, and, and if we could ever really know that. Uh, can you can you talk a little bit about hoodoo magic and um, and describe how it is that you worked it in and out of your story? Absolutely. Um, so coming from uh, my historical my historical background, my personal background, um, my parents are from West Africa, from Ghana, um, and then I was born in England. I grew up largely uh, in New Jersey and New York. 
Um, and so I, I, until I wrote this book, I actually had never been to Ghana. Um, and one thing that I sort of remember from my childhood was these stories that my parents would tell me, these um, trickster stories. So they told me the stories of Nancy, the spider, and um, he's sort of this trickster figure who is uh, familiar throughout other cultures, but specifically he is sort of outsmarting the larger um, characters in his world, whether it's the lion or the snake. Uh, and I remember always hearing those and sort of finding comfort in them, but also not really understanding um, <laughs> sort of the lion and, and, the, and, and the snake and all of that in my own life in New Jersey. And then I, as I got older and started studying African-American history and I found the Br'er Rabbit stories, um, which figure largely into the book. I it sort of was a light bulb moment for me, mm -hmm. and those those stories were um, brought over and, and retained in that memory of of slavery and and told throughout families. And so the idea that that folklore is passed down in that way, um, in in my immediate sense with my family, and then through all that history, um, really invoked in me a, a sort of study of, of folklore and, and a, a use of that style in writing this book. And so I think even in the section that I just read, there is a sort of like folkloric um, storytelling uh, style that I really wanted to echo. Um, and so with that, <laughs> going back to the hoodoo, um, <laughs> there is a sort of like sense of that being passed through, right? Pass through the family and, and pass through the memory. Um, and so what endures, what is, what is kept? And I think there's a connection of survival, um, of teaching a child how to survive, how to outwit the larger animal. And then also um, just these healing practices, um, these practices of self-defense, of, um, of imbuing some kind of power or control over the world. Mm -hmm. um, and why is that so important? Why is that so enduring? So all of that really was something that I wanted to build into the novel, that, that endurance of, of survival um, in all its forms. Mm -hmm. yes. Book clubs are going to have a great time with this book, and I'm sure many of them already are. There are so many layers in it, the interaction between the characters, the healing, the hoodoo, and the slavery with all its ramifications. Can you talk a little bit about your decisions in incorporating these various layers into the yeah. novel? So as Rosemary said, <laughs> it's, it's the kind of book I hope that, that you can read you know, once, twice, three times, um, because there are those sort of um, layers and twists and turns, and and that's the sort of thing that I love to read, right? As a writer, you always want to write your next favorite book, um, and so I really wanted it to have these sort of rich twists and turns and, and layers, and and that level of, like, you can call up your best friend and say, did you read this part, and did you, what do you think of this, and sort of all that speculation, or even after you see a great movie and you argue with it, argue with your friends about <laughs> what you think happened in it, all of that is sort of my favorite part of a book. And so I definitely wanted to have that, that book club feel. Um, and yeah, and also the sort of braided narrative, I think lends itself as well to sort of, um, to sort of a, a mirroring of scenes and, a, and an exploration of what does this, chapter mean in relation to this chapter um and so all of that I just wanted it to be even though it's a heavy subject matter I wanted it to sort of be this fun layered um complicated story mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well it definitely was that and did did make it was not off-putting at all in its complexity I think it's just very very engaging and now, now I read a wonderful quote by you, Afia, in Library Journal magazine. I know you worked in libraries. You mentioned that earlier in, in our interview, um, in your early part of your career anyway. Um, in, that, in, the, in the article, you were quoted as saying, you were talking about slavery stories, and you said that they must be told and told again. And what you were quoted as saying is, we haven't learned enough from our history we need to look deeply in the mirror 
but there is undoubtedly a fatigue for the slave novel, for the cast as victimizers as much as for those cast as victims. As a quote unquote genre, the slave novel hasn't even begun to scratch the psychological genre. The slave novel hasn't even begun to scratch the psychological depths of what it means to enslave other humans or to be enslaved. This is a shared history. Can you expand on this? Absolutely, yeah. I think, again, going back to, to why I started writing this story, I think I had no intention of writing a, a slave novel. I think I mentioned that fatigue in, in that quote, and I think there is a sense of not wanting to look at such a such a complex, ugly history. Um, again, right? It feels like we have um, roots, we have beloved, and it, it almost feels like okay. Do we want to dive into such a a complicated past? Um, but as a as a writer, I thought okay, we have those images, we have those stories, beautifully done. Um, Toni Morrison is one of my favorite writers. Um, I'm sure that's apparent. Uh, but I think we also have a very sort of blanket sense of what that time period looks like, of, of whippings, of um, war, of, uh, you know, gone with the wind, sort of, um, sort of one story. And I think it's a rich, a, a rich time period, right? I mean, rich in, in the sense of just no one experience could be like any other. Um, and so to, to only tell one story or to only say, well, that story is told and it's uncomfortable and we shouldn't explore it, kind of limits the, those people who are enslaved and limits um, the fullness of their lives and their experience beyond um, just being slaves. And so as I began to dive into the research and dive into, again, those sort of very personal experiences, I realized there's so much to be told and there's so many um, angles to look at the story from. And there's also so much for us to learn from, from um, things that are uncomfortable or things that are, are ugly or, um, complex, how did this happen, and what are the ramifications uh, of that time period that is not so far removed uh, from right now. And so I, I always say I could write another hundred books of just this time period, and I hope mm -hmm. that other people do as well, because I think there's just so much to be told and so much to be learned. Mm -hmm. The fact that you incorporated the time after the Civil War was so insightful because the, the slaves were anything but free. Of course, they were held back by the Jim Crow laws, among other demoralizing factors, and it must have been a very confusing, turbulent time for the freed slaves when the war ended. And I, I is what you're saying also incorporating that period of time. I, I know I've read much about the before period, but I really got a lot out of the book in looking at the period of time after the Civil War and what it felt like to the people in those slave communities. Was that part of that decision that you're talking about in, in showing the different aspects of it? Absolutely, yeah. As I said, I think I had an overview of this time period. I thought, okay, the Civil War happened, the slaves are freed, um, but what does that mean, freed? What what resources did they have? What were they able to do? And, and, and what life can you make for yourself um, after such an... Uh, such a turbulent time and not just for the slaves. I think I also wanted to explore the South and it's sort of um, its history and its um, struggles against itself um, and defining itself. And what do we see today that, that is reflective of that time? And so I just, again, had questions. I wanted to know what does that look like? What do you do in when you're said, when you're told that you're free? Um, what does that feel like? And so I really wanted to dive into that time. And again, I started with a 10-year period because I think the Reconstruction era, um, aside from being fascinatingly strict in, a, in its decade-long um, definition, 
um, is also sort of a, a time of flux that, that we don't get to talk about a lot. So I really wanted to, to place the book there and to sort of let it expand and unfold and, and see what directions it would take me in. Yeah, I, you know, the timing or the time period in a historical novel like this is is very important, but also how you use time in the book and how you tell the story. And, it, and in your case, I think I understood this correctly. I read it three times. I should be an expert on by now. It, you were moving in and out of time. You weren't, it wasn't a linear sort of, you, this started today and this happened then and this happened then. We were going back and forth from slavery time to reconstruction time. And, um, and, and in some ways I felt that that just, that was just sort of a, a very enriching way to read a book now in 2020 about this time period, because we know on the surface, many of us, what happened during that time. We don't have really, a, many of us, a deep understanding of it, but our understanding became deeper or minded in the way you fluctuated those stories. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit of how you worked with time and, and why you did that. Absolutely. So again, when I began the book, I thought that I was going to stay in that 10-year period. Um, mm -hmm. If you look at the uh, Rue's sort of adult um, storyline, it does very much stay in um, 1865 to 1875. Um, but as I was writing, I realized that I sort of, I couldn't tell that present story without, without reflecting on the past. What are the psychological effects? What is the the shared history of these people, what is passed down. Um, and so I wanted to enrich the story of more than just flashbacks as well. I didn't want it to just be, okay, a memory and then Rue moves forward. I really wanted to sort of have an immersive um, scene, if you will, of, of what brought her to the decision or the place that she was um, currently in, in the main time period. Um, in the way that I think our our personal histories and our own memories are always uh, layered on top of each other, are always sort of acting in our brains when we're moving forward, um, both personally and I think as as a country, as as people, um, as a as a nation. And so, it as I was writing it, absolutely became clear to me that that the past weaves and affects um, the forward narrative. Mm -hmm. So importantly that it had to sort of come crashing in um, as necessary throughout the story. Yeah, you know, it's almost as if the story evolved in that moving back and forth, that you knew this about Rue and you knew this about Verena and Sarah, but then as, and it was the same, but then you went forward and then you went back and you learned a little bit more about what happened back then. And like you were saying, um, you know, that is kind of how memory does work. And, and that's just another very, just one of very many components that make, I think, the book a, a fascinating read. Yeah. And you mentioned your background, which is very interesting, with a family from Ghana and being born in the UK and then spending time in the United States. And you also hinted a little bit about putting some of your own personal experiences or history into your writings. Did you do that? I mean, yes. is that, where did you do that is what I mean. <laughs> where, where is that? <laughs> well, it's funny. I always say um, when I was writing, as I was, I was saying earlier about not expecting to find myself in the novel as much as I did. Um, so one of the main components of the story is Rue falling around her mother as a younger child, when Rue's a younger child, following her mother, um, going through the plantation healing. And... I wrote that whole section just trying to write this sort of coming of age and uh you know I was speaking to my editor one day and she said you know you have this sort of fascination with Rue observing her mother um as a healer and she said you know what what is the fascination with that and I realized in that conversation that um uh, when I was a child my mom was a nurse and she was a home health aide um, and she would actually work in people's homes and sometimes she would take me with her. Um, and I didn't realize how much of that I was putting into the novel, that, that experience of seeing her in other people's homes, um, working for them, but also having strong relationships with them and, and healing them in respect um, and sort of the dynamics of her um, 
as an immigrant, as a Black woman, um, as an employee, um, but also as a healer. And so all of that informed who I am. Obviously, she <laughs> would have liked for me to be a doctor, but that didn't happen. But, <laughs> but somehow it all... For us, it did. <laughs> <laughs> but it all sort of snuck in, into the writing, and, and that wasn't something I realized I was even doing, and yet it, it informed the narrative. Um, and I think for Rue, and um, in, in just creating a character, I really wanted it to be about looking at your mother and looking at again, those, those figures and those female relationships and trying to decide who you are um, and who you want to be. And so that sort of mirrored my own experience. Mm -hmm. You do see Rue, you know, becoming her, very much her own woman uh, throughout the book and her mother, and you put her relationship with her mother is very sweet and um, mo moments where she's just watching her in awe and describing, you know, her time with her father or her time, you know, de dealing with some of the people who came, not just for their healing, but for their hoodoo magic that she um, also helped them with. Um, the characters, you know, of course, we talk a lot about them because I think this is a book, a character, of women. Uh, they are, you know, they're, they're just enormously uh, complex and impressive. And they're, you know, most of them are slaves. There are a few people who aren't, but, um, in the community, but they're very different. And we're often, we're sort of sometimes used to hearing stories. We talked a little bit about this already of, uh, of slaves uh, that are very, very flat and, you know, just a certain sort of archetypal character, but it's not the case in your characters. They are in many ways, um, as I'm reading them, I'm, I'm listening to the story of these very complex women. Um, and, but you know, I, I can I think of the Gone with the Wind, like you had mentioned earlier, which is which is just such a different kind of story. You don't there's no depth of understanding of the, especially uh, the black uh, characters in that story. Um, and and you have have really done a marvelous job of that. Um, I think for this generation and for generations to come, to have access to that, uh, could you, could you talk a little bit more about that? Or is there more to say? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's funny you bring up Gone with the Wind because yeah. I think, um, and sort of Gothic literature and Southern yeah. literature as a whole, because I do, even though I think there's a certain level of, of railing against that, I think mm -hmm. it's also a, the book. Yeah. My book for me is is a love story to those um, those sorts of. Uh, rich uh, gothic literature, right? mm -hmm. that sort of southern um, romance of, of the southern belle, and even Verena, um, you know, as a character is someone I wanted to give depth to, as sort of the daughter of the south, and what does it mean to have expectations um, of what your life is going to be, whether those expectations are right or wrong, um, ethically or, or morally speaking, but she was raised in a, in a in a world and what does it mean to to lose that world um to lose sort of the 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 power or the sense of pride that you've been imbued with um and so i wanted to to create those characters as well and really sort of um without having clear villains or or, or right and just right or wrong really paint a clear picture of how do these people find themselves um, in these situations, how do they make choices and what are their choices um, based on? And so for me, it was definitely exploring all of those sort of images again that we're familiar with and, and are drawn to um, and why are we drawn to them? Mm -hmm. You know, we mentioned hoodoo, of course, the traditional African-American spirituality. It was actually created by the enslaved African-Americans and then, we also briefly mentioned the traveling preacher and you you described his effect on the community and i guess i have a couple of questions in here did you research aspects of hoodoo and evangelical religion as you wrote this story and i'd love to hear you talk a little bit about how you see that interplay between those two aspects of spirituality yeah uh, so as for hoodoo and Voodoo and uh, Santeria and all these sorts of um, these practices that uh, you know uh, evolved in isolation, but also have these clear connections with each other. Um, 
and evolved in protest, but also uh, evolved in faith, right? Evolved in um, belief and also the sense that you could sort of control um, the world around you or needed a way to feel that you could control the world around you. Um, I felt that that had a really fascinating um, connection with sort of uh, faith and religiousness as we understand it, um, sort of uh, Christianity as it relates to um, Africans and African Americans and enslaved people as sort of this really complicated um, uh, comfort in, in one respect, but also something that was forced upon them and, and um, beaten into them. And so it's this fascinating um, interplay in all these cultures of, of sort of faith and, and belief and uh, promise, right? The idea of the promised land or the idea of, of a heaven if you only um, live your life the way you're supposed to, whether that is uh, in being an obedient slave or um, being kind to others. And so <laughs> there's this really fascinating sort of interplay between all of those things that just uh, I have an interest in personally. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something that'll probably come up again in my work, uh, <laughs> even in things I'm currently writing. But just in this historical standpoint, in this time period, I think um, for enslaved people who were freed, it was a moment when they got to choose. Um, what did they believe in? And of course, the, the, the culture that you're raised in is going to shape um, what you eventually sort of believe in. Um, but in this time period, there were these sort of revival tents, there were these um, sort of interplays of uh, Christianity and magic and, and sort of keeping that cultural memory of um, Africa or West Africa, or things that even I remember growing up with, um, sort of practices that my parents had, mm -hmm. um, keeping those things alive while also um, sort of respecting and um, and performing within within the social context that you find yourself living in. Mm -hmm. um, and so, for me, the preacher, especially uh, Brett Abel was this figure who came in and sort of gave the slaves or the recently freed people um, a choice and Rue symbolizes sort of the other choice and so they're they're definitely going to have this um, this clash <laughs> of personality and faith and and what which way do you go forward and so I definitely wanted to place them uh, Rue and Bra Abel as these two pillars um, in conversation with each other of, of what do you choose and what do you believe and, and have them sort of fight with each other, which historically I think those, those the idea of magic and, and religion sort of do find themselves fighting with each other and also folk healing and sort of institutionalized medicine fighting against each other. And so all of that sort of plays out in the novel again in this 10 year period. Mm -hmm. So you, you um, we'll talk a little bit about you as a writer in your experience. You've already shared that you went to NYU, I think it was, and, and then got an MFA at Columbia University. Um, and, and when you started your writing career and things like that, you know, we are in a very, as you alluded to, a very interesting time period in our own history with this pandemic and, and, the, um, and what that has created and the challenges that's created for writers. It has writing um, become, or is it becoming what you had envisioned or hoped it would be for yourself? Yeah, I mean, uh, so my novel came out uh, this April, which was uh, pretty much at the height of things, <laughs> shutting down. And then all of a sudden, you know, I had a uh, book tour scheduled and all these sorts of things. Oh. And then it <laughs> turned into these sort of virtual experiences, which in a way um, gave me an opportunity to reach people, I think, that I never would have been able to to get to speak to about the book um so just in terms of the expectations of being an author i think <laughs> just like everything else we're all sort of running around reconfiguring um but then just uh, the story as a whole i think i never expected conjure women in the story of a, a strange illness and all this sort of um racial complexity in American history to all sort of lands right. <laughs> right now in this time period. I didn't expect a book about uh, sickness to be out during a pandemic. Um, 
so all of that sort of been a strange experience and then again I sort of uh, mentioned earlier the the concept of sort of living in an extraordinary time but being ordinary um, right. and all of that is sort of happening I, I think we're living in a time that is going to be uh, in history books with bullet points and and hopefully someone will <laughs> will come back and and write our our little lives a little bit in there and, and give um, give a face to the smaller characters and so it's been an interesting experience to sort of write historical fiction at all <laughs> mm -hmm. um, during this we, time. Yeah. Our, you know, the, we talked about the the slave narratives, you know, from the WPA, and and you may know that, of course, there's efforts, libraries throughout the country to gather the stories of people during this pandemic for very much the same reason. Um, and we uh, we have also the previous author we interviewed, Jim DeFelice, talked about how he used the stories of veterans and the Library of Congress has a, has a program called the Veterans History Project. So you just see that there are these opportunities that when we're um, living in them, we don't necessarily take advantage of them, but we now all have, you know, an opportunity to contribute to that, narr to the narrative of explaining and talking about what we're experiencing today. And I think your book, as well as Jim's, is an inspiration to do just that, you know, to explore how to, we, we might not write as beautifully as either of you do, but we have stories to tell, right? And we can, we can put them to paper and then hopefully people like you and Jim and other gifted writers will take them and create these these beautiful stories that go much further, you know, to, than just our own single story, but tell a whole community story and a and a whole experience of that. So, so I'm glad that it was that you're feeling, you know, uplifted by it and encouraged by the response that folks have had to your work. Definitely, it's finding people, which is which is an amazing experience, yeah. and then I get to speak to them, which yeah, is so, which is so exciting. Yeah. It's exciting. So, for the viewers and that are watching, that are writers, what would you say to them if, to become better writers, like you, with this terrific debut novel? So, what would you tell them? How would they? How would they best become better writers? Yeah, I think. I, I always got the advice to read, um, so I will say read, read widely, but I also always say um, read critically. Um, if you love something, figure out why you love it. Why does it have that effect on you if you hate it? <laughs> why do you hate it? Um, and then also I always say sort of um, look at other aspects. I know I love film and television and sort of that sort of storytelling. Um, or even uh, my mother, I always say she's definitely not a writer, but she's like the best storyteller I know. She'll tell you like what happened to her at work and it'll just be framed in this perfect way. And I feel like that is is a place that I reflect on, okay, what about her her joke or her story like affected me and um, just the way it's formed or, or told. And so I think there's even stand-up comedy, I was telling someone the other day, I think just the delivery of that sort of thing, there's a way to sort of um, study storytelling and all these aspects of your life. And so I think uh, uh, take everything in critically <laughs> and, and respond to it and then sit down and, and get to writing. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think, I think another important part which you engage in so well is of course talking about it. Um, talking about writing and reading with others. So um, we often talk about that in the world of libraries, how what's important to create readers and young readers, any age reader is to create this sort of community of then sharing what that experience was like for you. You know, like you said, what did you love? What did you hate? And some of us don't always put that to pen and paper or write an essay about it, but we do have that opportunity like we are now uh, to, to, to just talk to each other about it, to share it. There's uh, so many book clubs and book groups, but you don't have to have a formal experience. It, it's just, you know, what did you like about it? What didn't you like about it? And uh, it really, uh, it goes a long way to making readers who will then, of course, go a long way to making writers um, like yourself. So uh, this book, The uh, Conjure, Conjure Women, uh, you know, if you had to sell it like in a elevator speech or something to convince people to read it what would you say yeah i mean i think you guys have done a fantastic job <laughs> of convincing people to read it but yeah 
I mean, I think Conjure Woman is a story of um, shared history and uh, personal history. Um, it's a story of American history. It's a story about ghosts um, and confronting um, who you are, confronting the things that haunt you um, to hopefully move forward. I think that's the sort of moral arc of the thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I'm going to read it all over I'll, again now. I'll read it for the fourth time. I'll read it for the fourth time. <laughs> hey, before you go, are there any new books on the horizon? She said, hopefully. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, yes. I am writing very fast and very furiously to meet some deadlines that I have with my editor um, <laughs> at the moment. Uh, but so I love historical fiction. Obviously, I think that's very plain. Um, so right now I'm working on sort of a 1920s Harlem Renaissance jazz age uh, book that hopefully has some uh, some similarities to to Conjure Women, but I also think it's sort of this more uh, fast paced modern um, experience with cars and, and jazz clubs, and so I'm having a lot of fun with that. And it seems to be forming into a bit of a murder mystery. Um, so we'll see how that shapes out. And then again, it sort of has um, weight in our current time and we're all talking about the Spanish flu and all these things so I think there, there's that uh, that modernism aspect as well but yeah I'm having fun just writing a jazz age mystery at the moment. Oh, lovely. <laughs> good. We shouldn't keep her much longer than Rosemary so she can try and make her deadlines. Well I do want to encourage you also as you may not need encouragement, I don't know how your editor feels, but you know the characters that you built in this Conjure Women, I may have, I'm sure, many more stories to tell about Thank them. Um, and I especially would encourage you to pursue the relationship between Rue and Verena, which I think is such a complex, but a definitely a, a very heartwarming and um, and just challenging a relationship that that we all, especially in this time would benefit from, from seeing how they developed in their life together and the complexity of their friendship. Um, so we are coming to a close of our time together, which is always hard, as you can tell, I don't want it to end. But um, did you have anything else that you'd like to share with us? No, I think uh, hopefully continue reading, um, enjoy the book, read it again. <laughs> Again as again. you said yep and then um you can find me on twitter or instagram um and if you enjoyed the book out there in the world of viewers um please send a review that helps so much um yeah and if you haven't read it yet do support libraries and bookstores um everybody needs help right now <laughs> indeed well i would like to also just remind viewers about how to get your book because so normally when we have these in live person we have copies of the book right there right. <laughs> uh, but we you know of course there are bookstores but there are libraries and and i did ask afia early on about her book is whether it's available in audiobook at our library here um, at the albert wisner public library but any library um, has access to hard print material. You just need to go in and ask for it. If it's not on their shelves, they'll know how to find it for you. Uh, we certainly have copies of it. We also have um, access to eBooks um, so that you can download it for free. Be using our over we use the OverDrive platform. And OverDrive has made uh, something very interesting available, which is this on demand so that now you don't have to wait. And we have selected your book, Athea, to be available for on demand. So oh, yeah. that if anyone wants to um, a copy of it electronically to put on their iPad or Kindle or computer to read, all they have to do is go to our website at www.albertwisnerlibrary.org and, and, and learn how to download material. And it, they won't have any weight whatsoever to begin reading it um, and enjoying it. We also have Hoopla, which is another streaming uh, service that it's available on. So we really, there are a variety of ways when we all need to stay apart from each other um, and maybe not as, a little more reluctant to come into the library or even into your local bookstore, um, aside from ordering it on online for yourself, which is also a good thing to do. So we encourage you to do that. And we really, I'm really very delighted. It was, uh, I was just enjoyed meeting you for the first time several months ago at another library event. And, and I'm very proud to have you here at our 
Authors Out Loud series. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Rosemary. Thank you, Susie. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. See you. All righty. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>